Hi, in this lecture, we will look at the physiology of the female reproductive system, and we'll start with the process of oogenesis. So oogenesis, or oogenesis, is the process of forming the egg, and the egg is known as the oocyte. Now, it's going to be a bit different in the female versus the male. For one thing, a female is born with all the eggs she can release. In fact, as a fetus, all of the eggs start meiosis and then they stop, they're stalled. And then from puberty until menopause, once a month, one egg, typically only one, is going to mature and be ovulated. Remember, a male is going to make sperm daily from puberty until the day they die. Whereas for women, the reproductive portions of our lives are between the puberty and menopause. And so when a female is born, she has all her eggs stalled in meiosis. We got plenty of them. Okay, now they say we have 700,000. You probably only release about 500 your entire time from puberty to menopause. But then after puberty, typically one is allowed to finish meiosis. So it'll go through meiosis one and meiosis two. And what we end up getting is the ovum, um, which is the oocyte, and then we get these things called polar bodies. So when the male undergoes the formation of sperm, they get four sperm. For the female, we will get one egg, functional egg, and we get three cells called polar bodies, and the polar bodies will just degenerate. Otherwise, every time we got pregnant, we would have a litter. We would have four, right? Four embryos each time, and um, obviously we're not suited for that. The ovarian cycle are the events that happen in the ovaries, and so what's basically going to happen is you have the ovaries, and inside are these follicles, and notice the follicles are in different stages of development. Remember, they all have the oocytes in meiosis one. Now, these follicles, notice, are different sizes, so as the follicles mature, they get bigger, and as they mature and get bigger, they're going to release estrogen. So as the follicle enlarges, estrogen levels go up. And if we look at the ovarian cycle, it's divided into three stages or phases. The very first one is called the follicular phase. And we're going to pretend that or use a 28-day cycle, which is typical. Yours might not be 28 days um, if you're female, but we're going to use that number. So it all starts with the follicular phase in which the follicle starts to grow. So we start with a primary follicle, it's under control of follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary, and it has what's called a primary oocyte. Well, as that follicle matures and gets bigger, the oocyte continues through meiosis, and we get what's called a secondary follicle, and then we get a larger follicle called a tertiary, or a graphian, so primary, secondary, tertiary, one, two, three, and then the tertiary is sometimes called a graphene follicle. Look how big it is. It gets this fluid inside it too called the antrum, and roughly around eight to 10 days after you start this cycle. And so what's going to happen is that oocyte is going to finish meiosis one. So the follicle phase or follicular phase, roughly days one through 14 total, and it's under control of GnRH and FSH, Follicle gets bigger, oocyte finishes meiosis, continues to mature until we get to our second phase of the follicle of the ovarian cycle, which is the ovulation. So it's the graphene follicle, the large one, that's going to rupture and release the egg, and it actually eats away at the outside of the ovary. So sometimes you might feel it when you ovulate. It could be a little bit painful. The ovaries usually take turns. So if it's the right ovary one month, it's the left ovary the next month. And here you can see the picture as that oocyte starts to eat away and release enzymes so it can be released, which is ovulation, which usually is around day 14. Now we'll be talking about LH shortly, or luteinizing hormone, and luteinizing hormone is key for ovulation. Once that follicle ruptures and the oocyte is released, what's left over is called a ruptured follicle, which is known as a corpus luteum. So the luteal stage is going to begin right after ovulation because that's when I have a corpus luteum. So that follicle ruptures, we have a corpus luteum, it looks yellow, there's a lot of cholesterol here. Um, because remember, the hormones coming from here are progesterone and estrogen, but it's the corpus luteum that makes progesterone. So the follicles of the ovary are going to make estrogen. The ruptured follicle 
or the corpus luteum will secrete progesterone. So both hormones are going to come from the ovary. And the progesterone levels usually go up for about a week, and it really just depends if fertilization occurs or not. So what's actually ovulated is called the secondary oocyte. If that gets fertilized, that's a completely different process than if it's not fertilized. So if it's fertilized, the progesterone and estrogen levels are gonna keep going up, and then we're going to form a placenta over time to maintain the pregnancy. If it's not fertilized, the corpus luteum just degenerates and progesterone and estrogen levels fall, and that's what triggers the cycle to start all over again. So it's a cycle that's going to occur, and we have our follicular phase as the follicle grows. Notice as the follicle grows, it's going to release estrogen, and then we're going to have ovulation occur for the ovulatory phase, and then we get the corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum is going to produce the progesterone. So it's all under control of GnRH. That's what starts the whole process. That's what goes up at puberty to trigger the puberty. And then GnRH goes to the anterior pituitary gland, and then it will trigger the release of FSH, which is going to turn on the ovarian cycle and allow the follicle to grow. So we have our GnRH, which is key player. It does change frequencies and amplitude. Don't worry too much about that, but it can actually change like how fast it releases the hormones. But we know that once we have the GnRH, we're going to release FSH, which is called follicle stimulating hormone. So it tells you exactly what it does. It stimulates that follicle to grow. As the follicle grows, look at the estrogen levels the estrogen levels go up. It's going to produce estrogen. Now, when estrogen reaches a certain level, that's what triggers LH. So we have this complicated play here. We have FSH is first. That causes the follicle to grow, which produces estrogen. And when estrogen reaches a critical value, that's what triggers the LH surge. It spikes for about 24 hours. And then that's what triggers ovulation. And typically, and I don't know why, but when ovulation occurs, your body temperature falls. So you can take your temperature first thing in the morning, and typically on the day you ovulate, it falls by about one degree. So when we have this estrogen, it's our anabolic hormone for females. It does cause bone and muscle growth. It causes the secondary sex characteristics in the female. So things that happen at puberty, pubic hair, body hair, breast tissue, more adipose tissue. Excuse me, it does affect the CNS and it can affect the sex drive. The estrogen can help with the libido and sex drive. It maintains the reproductive organs and glands for the female reproductive system. And it also helps with the endometrium. So if we look at the uterine cycle now, we are going to see phases for this. So in the female, we have an ovarian cycle and a uterine cycle, and they have to be coordinated. The uterine cycle also has three phases. The first phase is the menses. So this is when the inner lining, that um, stratum functionalis is going to be shed. This is when you have your period. And then after that, we go into the proliferative phase and then the secretory or secretory phase. So if we're looking at a typical 28 day cycle, we've got our menstrual phase would be roughly days one through seven are happening. And then once that lining is shed, and again, this will be shed if pregnancy does not occur, then that is going to be rebuilt and become more vascular. So think about the cells are proliferating first and they're multiplying, and then they're going to get even more thicker because the idea is if that egg is fertilized, you want it to be able to implant where it has a really rich blood supply. So again, if we're looking at our typical cycle here and we're going over our hormones, we have our GnRH, goes to the anterior pituitary gland, FSH triggers the follicle, the follicle grows and makes estrogen, estrogen triggers LH, LH triggers ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum, and then the corpus luteum will make progesterone. And you can see again all the functions of the estrogen. And again, the uterine cycle are the events that happen in the uterus, and we're focusing on that endometrium, that stratum functionalis. And so the first part is 
the menstrual phase. So the day of your period, the first day of your period is the first day of your cycle. So if you become pregnant and they'll want to know what was the first day of your last period, because that's where we start counting. So again, the blood vessels constrict, so then that lining is sloughed off. A very painful period or menstrual cycle is known as dysmenorrhea. It's normal to have some cramping as that myometrium contracts. Once that's sloughed off, then we're going to slowly rebuild it with the proliferative phase. Now understand that the proliferative phase is happening during the follicular stage or the ovarian cycle. So both the menstrual and the proliferative are while that follicle is growing. If you look at the lining, we have the stratum functionalis. That's what's becoming um, thicker with cells and more blood because that's what the zygote will implant in. And if pregnancy does not occur, all these blood vessels are going to constrict, these cells die, and then they're shed. And then you have the last phase where you think about secretion, more glands, more cells, and this is going to start once ovulation occurs and take up most of that luteal phase um, of the ovarian cycle. So menarche is when you have your first menstrual cycle, your first uterine cycle, typically around ages 11 to 12, and it's the sign of puberty, whereas amenorrhea is if you don't have your menses. So primary means you just don't get it, and secondary is if it's interrupted for about six months or more. So we know stress can do this, a lot of emotional stress, the hypothalamus is tied in with GNRH. We also know that for estrogen, you need to have more body fat. So females need about 15% body fat in order to have enough estrogen to menstruate. So if you're a distance runner or maybe a figure skater or you're just very, very thin, if your body fat is too low, then you're going to stop menstruating and that's a sign that it's too low. So if we were trying to put all this together, you have this graph in your paper, in your handout, and so I just wanna to try to tie it into how it fits, you know, because we've got the ovarian cycle going, we have the uterine cycle going, they're both going at the same time, right? They have to be coordinated. This is why we're always so stressed out all the time. We got all this going on. Males have a 24-hour testicular, testicular, testosterone cycle from the testes. So testosterone is a 24 hour cycle. It peaks in the morning and then it decreases. For the females, we have this 28 day thing. So we start with GNRH, GNRH levels go up, that triggers FSH. Once I release FSH, my follicle is going to grow. So if I'm looking at my ovarian cycle, I'm in the follicular phase. If I look in my uterine cycle, during the ovarian, when the follicle grows, I have my period and I'm starting the proliferative phase. Now, estrogen is going to be produced, right? As that follicle grows, it's going to increase estrogen. When estrogen reaches a critical point, it triggers the release of LH. We call it the LH surge or LH spike. And that's only there for about 24 hours. So if there's problems with infertility, you're gonna be going probably every day to get your levels checked because the LH surge um, is what's going to trigger the ovulation. Once I have the ovulation, I have a corpus luteum. Remember, this is the ruptured follicle. That is going to make progesterone. So notice progesterone levels now go up. And during the luteal phase is when I'm in the secretion part the secretion phase of my uterine cycle. Remember at ovulation, basal body temperature, your temperature first thing in the morning, tends to drop by about one degree. And when you ovulate, that oocyte is viable for about 24 hours. So that's why it's so important to know when you ovulate. Sperm can survive inside the female reproductive tract for about five to seven days. So understand, you could have intercourse a week before you ovulate, and technically, you could still get pregnant because we're going to assume that there's super sperm that can survive five to seven days. Or since the egg is viable for 24 hours, you could have intercourse one day after ovulation, which could still result in a pregnancy. So it's more like an eight-day window each month for pregnancy to occur, not just one day. Menopause is at the other end at what happens is we start to decrease estrogen. So we stop the ovulation, the menstrual cycle ceases. It varies with aging. If, if you um, 
It tends to be genetic. So if you're female, you can talk to your mom about when she went through it. But we start to decrease our estrogen and progesterone. Um, initially, these hormones go up, G and RH, because FSH and LH, because estrogen is tanking. So they're like yelling to the ovaries, make more estrogen, make more estrogen. And the ovaries are like, no, I'm done. I'm not making any more. And so we go into what's called perimenopause first. And this is where things start to get really irregular. You're having changes in the hormone levels. Um, you get a lot of, um, it causes issues with body temperature. So you can have like total, like when you're like sweating and super, super hot, you can have irritability and just not feel right. And this is the time be before the menopause and perimenopause sometimes in some women can last several years. Once those estrogen levels fall, then we're going to start to have changes to the reproductive organs in the female. So the uterus and the breast size usually decreases. It can cause changes to the epithelium um, in the vagina as well, in the urethra. And then we do know that estrogen was important for um, maintaining bone strength. So we see more issues with osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. And estrogen also helped maintain HDL levels. And so that was the good cholesterol. So women that are postmenopausal have a higher risk of heart attacks than premenopausal female. And as we mentioned, we can have changes to body temperature with hormones. So usually with ovulation, our body temperature falls and then the day after it's going to go up. And then we also are going to have issues when we hit menopause with hot flashes and changes with temperature. And we'll wrap up this lecture with sex as well. So not to make a pun, however, this one will take a little bit longer than it did for the men. So when we look at the female sexual response, we have the same basic flow. We have the excitement, the plateau, the orgasm, and the resolution. We still use the parasympathetic division. The clitoris does become erect. It does use nitric oxide as a dilator. There's increase in secretions from cervical and vestibular glands. As far as the actual orgasm, it's similar, like we talked about, smooth muscle contractions, all that, that myometrium, the vagina walls. We do have the release of oxytocin. Now, another difference, though, is this resolution phase um, for women versus men. So when you're looking at the guys, they have this resolution and this refractory period, and so their refractory period is a little bit longer than it is for female. When you have the females, the relative refractory period or the refractory period is much smaller. Well, why is it a smaller refractory period? Or I should say shorter. So remember the refractory period is the time between you can have basically another orgasm, those smooth muscle contractions of the uterus. So why is it shorter in a female? Well, females get to have babies. And when you're having a baby and that uterus is contracting to, to push that baby out, you don't get to take a break for a couple hours and come back later. So you have to have a very short refractory period to keep having those muscle contractions. So we have the babies, but we have a shorter refractory period so we can have more than one orgasm when we have sexual intercourse because it's not as long of a time between them. So a trade-off, I guess. When we look at the response, again, you can see here the resolution that you can have you know, multiple orgasms, multiple contractions can occur because of the refractory period. We know that, again, oxytocin is released, so same as with the guys. It's going to cause increased feeling of love and intimacy, and that's going to go up. There's been some research that also says that it, uh, it strengthens the immune system, so it helps give you a stronger immune system, and we know it also helps helps with pain relief as well. So those are some other reasons and benefits um, of the orgasm. I put this in your notes if you like the little table format of some of these hormones that you need to know. So you can see the GnRH, the FSH, the LH. And then over here you can see the estrogen. And in your handout you have estradiol because it tends to be in the estradiol form. If you have blood work done to look at estrogen levels, it'll probably say estradiol on it. So this finishes our lecture on the physiology of the female reproductive system.